Um, <clears throat> so I am going to talk to you about um, uh, my work on trying to implement uh, efficient immutable vectors in yeah. Haskell. Um, and we want to essentially go through uh, both kind of what, what is my motivation, what I want to get out of it, um, and <clears throat> then first cover some of the kind of theoretical stuff, how uh, of a particular way of understanding uh, uh, efficient vectors. Um, that is has nothing to do with Haskell per se, and then we'll go into you know what I'm trying to do in Haskell. Um, if you have any questions, then then just shout. Uh, I think you have like 30, 40 minutes of, of pure presentation without any questions, so more than happy to take them. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, um, I'm after something that is you know. Uh, has low memory overhead, and uh, you know, in principle, the perfect uh, way of representing a sequence would be a vector, right? It's, it's essentially just just flat array with pointers. The problem is that then you can't really modify it without a full copy uh, in a setting like Haskell. Um, and I do want to be able to, you know, maybe append some elements to the end, or, or you know, occasionally uh, update some some elements, something like that, or maybe concatenate them. Um, <clears throat> but I do care about uh, you know very quick indexing, so it should kind of feel like like an array, um, and yeah, just not not cost too much in terms of in terms of options. And so if you think about a data vector, is essentially this flat flat memory array, right? This is uh, if you don't need to modify uh, anything ever, that's like the best thing. Yeah, you just construct it once, you can quickly index into it, and then you have it. Um, data that sequence gives you the ability to modify things uh, fairly quickly, especially you know uh, at the both ends of a sequence. Uh, but it's fairly uh, <coughs> has fairly high memory overhead, uh, and indexing is actually not not a whole you know, not really all that fast. And I'll have a, a kind of comparison later. And um, another um, kind of motivation is, or the part of motivation is. You know, Haskell's lists are tend to be used a lot, and I would claim that they tend to be slightly overused. Um, and they're great for some things and not great for other things. Um, I think, you know, for whatever you want, you actually want to store the whole data structure, uh, all the elements, um, and you force it, it tends to be inefficient. Right? It's like the memory overhead is, is quite crazy. And on the other hand, it's actually pretty cool if you if you just look at something that is lazy, that is not false, just as a kind of alternative to, to what other languages do for iterators. Um, and the reason why uh, the, the uh, memory overhead is so high is that essentially every element, every cell of, of a list is going to be something like a, a GC header, so that's something that you know has to uh, GMC, GHC's GC will use to, to figure things out. Then you pointer to whatever you spawn in the list, and then another pointer to the next element of the list, right? So you can see that you have essentially two words of overhead for every single single element of, of your collection. Um, so not not too great on the store or uh, so <coughs> Uh, that was my motivation. The disclaimer is sadly that uh, the, the library that I'm uh, working on is not really ready yet. Um, I was hoping that I'm going to make it uh, until, until January and then blow more time trying to experiment with different approaches and trying to optimize things. Uh, so it's sorry. Um, but all those results are going to be preliminary. Um, I hope to finish the stuff within the next few weeks. Um, what is it based on? So. And there's been a really cool paper at ICFP uh, that actually talks about uh, data structures. Um, and there's also a master thesis written uh, essentially on, on that topic and uh, uh, in an attempt to replace the immutable vector in Scala collections in the public library of Scala. Um, and, and essentially the RRP vector is what we're going to be looking mostly at and what I'm interested in it. And I'm going to explain what it actually means. And there's also the, the third one that I'm actually not using entirely. It, it has some, just initially uh, giving me some, some inspiration, and I think I'm going to partially use some of the ideas, but not for the core data structure. So we'll essentially get back to um, what I'm doing with it. And if you actually want to just look at the code, uh, there are some nice implementations probably. So I think SCAS, the current release, I think it's 2.0. 
blue using the, the uh, not re the R vector, that I'm going to introduce in a second, not yet the, the R RV. Um, <coughs> and the master thesis is essentially about making the, the switch. And there's also a Rust, a nice Rust package um, that also uh, is building on those yeah. ideas. Um, so the RV vectors, um, so this is the, what they call erotic expanse vectors. Um, the basic idea is actually, <coughs> uh, you might, if you're familiar with uh, the unordered containers in Haskell, they are essentially based on similar, similar insights of saying, oh, let's have a tree structure that has a very high branching factor, something like 16 or 32, such that even if you have you know, a huge number of elements, you still have a very, very shallow structure, very few layers to go through. Um, and this is kind of, uh, uh, you can think of this work to be in the same line, in the, in the same area. Um, so usually I think the papers recommend uh, something like 32 for a branching factor. I'm looking at 16 and I think one, another container has also used 16. Uh, but it still gives you, you know, with, with just four levels of, uh, and branching factor of 32 and four levels, you can store tons of elements, right? You, you essentially have, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of a uh, huge collection with just a few layers of markers. And Rad is based indexing, so uh, let's get back, uh, let's, let's get um, to kind of explaining what it actually is. Um, so for examples, I'm going to be using branching factor only of four because size. Uh, it's actually kind of a pain to present it otherwise. Um, and essentially the, the idea is uh, that you know you have those layers at, at the very bottom, those guys are uh, what I you know, uh, call the leaves. Um, actually contain or install the values that you want to have in the, in the in store in your collection. The other guys just, just you know, uh, provide the structure. Um, so in order to understand uh, why the indexing is pretty fast, we're going to just go through an example. Um, so let's say we, this is a you know, full vector uh, of two levels and we want to get um, um, of branching factor four, and we don't want to get the twenty-fifth element, uh, or sorry, the sixth element uh, index is twenty-five, right? So if we're indexing starting at zero, that gives you the sixth element. So essentially, what you do is you take the index and extract um, the you know if you have branching factor of two, you extract two bits and use those two bits uh, to index in zero array, right? So. 0, 0, if you had 0, 0, that would be the, the first pointer. 0, 1, it's going to be the second pointer. And, and you follow that line. Um, at the next level, you look at the next two bits, right? And you, you know, look at 1, 0 as an index into, you know, for an array. And you say, well, that's going to be the third one. Um, and then you index into, into that. And then at the very end, you uh, we look at the last two bits and do the very same thing for the leaves, and we get the value in return. Um, so that's all nice and beautiful and stuff. However, it only works if you actually have full uh, vectors, right? Like, you can't have only 10 elements here because you would have made the wrong decisions in terms of which is the 25th element, the 26th element, right? So this only works if you really have you know, full, uh, full uh, vector, uh, especially in the front. Um, so in order to kind of um, be a bit more flexible, like um, you know, we, if, if you were to maintain this environment, anything like a, a prepending a value to the vector would require something like a copy or something, right? Like full reconstruction. So instead, um, the solution is to keep track of what is the starting index and what is the, the ending index, the last index? And the idea here is that um, we're going to pre pretend that the, the, you know, the elements on the left at the front of the vector are full, that the, all the arrays are full, uh, and still use the radix indexing, just pretending that um, we are, have a larger vector than we have. So how does that work? Um, essentially, like say for so this part, yeah? Okay. What's a vector in your definition, like the high level sequence, operator? Sequence of uh, values, essentially. And, well, normally if you have like mathematical sequence, you usually index this based on zero. So in your case, the... Same. 
Yes. So how, how can it be empty at the front end? So in what you're trying to do, optimize for the case <coughs> when somebody wants to prepend to so the sequence? The, so the, the problem is the following, right? <coughs> um, for, for something like zero-based indexing, right? You cannot have gaps here. You need to have every, all the elements here, right? That's what you're saying. Oh, oh, so you're saying the logical index is still in, in, the, in the next slide. The logical yeah. index is still zero, but the physical yeah. index is kind of three. Yeah, I was uh, kind of about to show it. Okay. Uh, so yes, okay. essentially, because you know, fundamentally, if we just you know, didn't do anything, right? You always need to have the the, you know, the front needs to always be full, right? Exactly due to the reasons you're saying. You know, you count it down. Okay. Uh, so instead, if you know which one is, is the you know which is the starting index, right? You can essentially say, well, if I want to get the fourth element, right? If I didn't do anything, I would grab this one, but this is really the first one that we have, right? We really want to have this guy. So instead, you know, you take this part, the, the kind of offset, if you think uh, about it, add it up and say, well, uh, I know that I started three. I going to pretend this is full, so I'm going to actually index at seven, right? And then get the right the red value. So this essentially allows you to have, you know, have not, uh, you know, not have full, uh, full leaves, full uh, nodes at the front of the, of the vector, and pretend, and still be able to use this right based indexing, pretend that you can, you know, essentially offset it. So the data is in the leaves, right? Yeah. And then you store all the indices in a separate data structure. Like no, no, no. So essentially the idea is that, yeah. think about the C++ vector. You don't store any indexes, right? It's just, you know, they're implicit in the size. They always start at zero. Mm. Because all the elements are the same size. Right, so it's, it's, it's very much the interface, the idea of, of the interface is the same with data to sequence and data to vector, right? Uh, you essentially have a collection of, of, of you know, elements that are in some order collection and you can access them using indexes from zero to the size n one, right? Uh, so the same like C++ vector, same like data to vector, same as um, data to sequence. Here I'm trying to know what is inside, what, how do we organize the data inside? And you know, in a particular case, if you actually don't have, you know, at the front, you, you know, if, if at the beginning you only had those elements, right, and you want to prepend something, then you need to have some kind of a mechanism to kind of offset the, this 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 uh, part that at the front you don't have for all the all the elements. Mm -hmm. And this kind of you know, keeping track of what is the starting index allows you to essentially cheat and. and Pretend that you actually have a full vector and you use the same indexing. You just that need to um, kind of add it up before you start indexing. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. If, if you don't have any questions, feel free to do that. Right. Um, <clears throat> so it's great. Um, it's very fast-intensive indexing because at that level you really do a few shifts and whatnot, um, and just indexing into those those arrays. And therefore, the memory overhead is also fairly low, just, just flat arrays with, with functions. Um, pretty much everything is logarithmic um, in terms of you know, operations like update, take drop, pushing to the front or the back. So we still need to update the, the branches, right? But it's, it all works out quite nicely. However, um, so you not meant to, you know, we, we do need to have those arrays being you know, always of the same size because we need to be able to select the, the right element. And concatenation becomes a problem. So let's go back into this example. If you think about it, if we were to concatenate this guy with itself, right, we would essentially need to have put this somehow merge one element leaf and two element leaf and have a full bar, full, full leaf, right? Because we cannot support having gaps in the middle. We can have not, you know, uh, the front might not be full because we have the starting index. The back might, you know, doesn't need to be full because we know where, where we end we can do the balance checking. However, in the middle, we have no mechanism to like, and somehow record the information that something in the middle, there's a gap there. And, and 
if there is a gap, then the whole radix based indexing completely breaks, right? Because it assumes that everything, you know, each uh, child has the same size. So that essentially means that with those dice, if you want to concatenate, you need to re rebuild one of the size at least, right? You need to essentially uh, throw away the structure and, and do a linear one of the size. Does that make sense? So that's where this second R comes in. In R vectors, they are called relaxed radix R vectors. And so we still get the, the same uh, benefits in terms of the tree structure is, is shallow. We have a very high branching factor. So uh, this way, the, the sample is kind of the same. But um, we get essentially this, this, uh, this, these properties that we no longer require that everything is, is full. Uh, and in particular, we can support having um, gaps, having leaves or branches in the middle that are not completely filled. And that then enables us to say, well, now we can do those concatenations logarithmically because you know, even if we had a gap uh, at, the, at the boundary there, we can still <coughs> recall this information somehow. And you know, uh, essentially, concatenation becomes just merging things at, at the right levels. And that's roughly it. And the price to be paid uh, is that this radix based indexing is only done usually. <laughs> so we then can't always uh, you know, use the same mechanism. Um, so the solution that they came up with is essentially <laughs> each node that is not full um, or in a way uh, not balanced, um, okay, balance is the problem of the right word, each node that is not full um, or that has child, children that are not full keeps, you know, essentially in a side, uh, side information and uh, that records the sizes, the cumulative sizes of all the children. So conceptually, if you think about the previous, previous case, right, we had this special offset, the start index, that allowed us to, to pretend that there were some more elements in front than there actually were. This is trying to do the kind of the same thing, except for every child, because you know, every one of them can be in a situation when you know something not full was on the in front of it, um, I hope this is going to be more clear with an example. So let's say we had somewhat similar structure as before, um, and here we have five uh, five elements at, at the leaves in in total. Here we have fifty, and in this branch we have forty. So our and uh, this, this kind of extra area on the side, or you know, for each child we're going to have you know cumulative size. So this is going to be five. The next one, together with the previous one, is 20. And the last one, you know, all together, there are 34. And, and now we want to index, you know, get uh, index 28. Right? So, you know, conceptually, if you think about it, well, there are 20, 20 elements here, so we must go in this branch, right? And now, important. This stuff is not actually, you know, this is uh, just my representation. What you actually get is just the, the error that you actually implement, right? So, because the, the <coughs> uh, we have non-empty array, we need to essentially go through it and figure out um, which branch is going to be the right one to, to take. Uh, so you can, of course, you know, implement that using either something like binary search or linear search. But essentially what you were asking conceptually at least is, you know, is 28 smaller than, than 5? No, it's not. And is it smaller than 20, the next element, right? No, it's not. And then, you know, we get to the point of, yes, we you know, this is the, the third child is the one that where our element is going to be located. So that's the point that we're going to follow. And now becomes another second uh, uh, fun part. So now we would like to treat this sub subtree and, and say, well, let's just treat it like almost separately. What would be the index to use if we were cons to consider this guy by itself? Well, we skip 20 elements, right? So index 28 becomes index 8. And we're going to say, well, now I want to you know, look at this subtree and get the uh, you know, uh, element at index 8. 
that doesn't make sense. So I think that's probably a tricky part. And here, now, there, we still have the, the same kind of kind of node, like here, but there is no uh, side array with, with uh, the extra sizes. That's, uh, that's how we can represent that it actually doesn't need it. And so we can switch to our standard previous way of doing indexing, which is this radical based fix of let's you know, look at the, the two bits and select the element in this array based on that. Um, and that gives us um, the third element. And we get to leave, and again, uh, leaves are always considered full, so we can just say, well, take this zero fill and then that's a new zero, and we're done. So essentially, you know, as you can see, this guy in the middle is not full, and we still are able to, to you know, perform all the indexing that we need. Uh, essentially, by, by keeping this extra, extra side information about how many elements are in it, each branch. Um, <clears throat> right, so um, essentially uh, we can use the radix based indexing um, in the subject where you know, we don't need the size. If we do need the, those sizes at the, at the side, uh, at, on the side, we need to look at, at them, but uh, that means that we can have gaps. Uh, we can have you know arrays that are not full, um, and we still need to keep the, the actual full size of the of the vector for things like efficient balance checking and whatnot. But uh, that essentially allows us to get the, the concatenation working in, in logarithmic time, because even if we create gaps, we can't we think we can because we can't avoid them. We can still represent them. We can still um, so create a tree structure that we can index into. And the price to be paid, of course, is that this search on the <clears throat> this search for which which child do I pick based on the sizes will be slower than just a few shifts. You know, you need to either do the the linear search or, or binary search. In my experiments, um, they actually perform almost the same uh, because you know you have only like 16 elements, so it kind of doesn't matter much um, which one you need to pick. Can you do SSC stuff? I don't. Um, because SSO. So I, so well, 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 well. I think <laughs> there was a GSOC last year that added a very preliminary support for vector instructions in GNC. Mm. I have not tried it yet. Mm. Um, but that was actually quite interesting to see. Um, I don't know, I haven't tried it at I would be very interested. I, quite frankly, I would, might be more interested in uh, making things like copies of arrays faster using some simple instructions. Um, then I would be with necessarily the search because if you saw, you know, in, in this example, if you think about it, we only use it at the, at the top, right? And the idea of many of the algorithms that we look at is that they try to optimize such that you have as few as few of those nodes that have the, the extra array, such that you know, we just are faster in the subtree, because in the subtree we're essentially as fast as we uh, get, right? The other thing to notice is that this is not full, right? Like, this guy has only two elements here. We still can use the radix indexing because the front is full, right? So that's the, that's the key, key, one of the key things. So essentially, if you, if you only construct a such a structure once and only say append to the back of the vector, you're never going to be in a situation where you need this side side array, right? You're always going to have this nice, nice, um, faster version. It's only when essentially you concatenate or you add elements to the front um, of the other vector, right? Because if, if you add to the, if you no, if you add it, if you have a full, full perfectly full balanced vector and you add it to the front, you essentially need to have this um, right, <clears throat> and of course there's the, uh, you know, the cost of extra logic that you need to keep around, so essentially anytime you do, uh, especially operations like uh, take or drop and, uh, or concat or whatnot, you might get in a situation where a node that required this extra information, this, this extra sizes information, might no longer require it. 
uh, for instance, if you pr push something to the front, and you, by push, pushing the new element to the front, get something that is full, right? You can drop those those extra arrays, but you know you need to detect this situation and and um, uh, just keep track of what is what is where what is happening. So that's the base, the, the kind of background of the data structure. Is anything else here? Uh, do you have a look at that? Uh, do you also support like fast splits of these uh, vectors? Right. So take and drop essentially does. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Um, it might produce two unbalanced ones, or at least one unbalanced one, right? Right, exactly. So <coughs> if you have a fully nice full, a take is fine, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, drop obviously is, is going to mess, mess things, or can mess things up. So yes, um, this is one of those, those cases. But that is persistent, right? So it will always share stuff. Yes, possible. yes. Mm -hmm. So this is still a tree that is persistent, and whenever we you know, do update, everything else is shared, except for the branch that we need to modify, as, as usual. Okay. Yes? Is there anything to it that um, is actually specific to vectors? Because so far it looks like you could uh, use this for other data types as well. I don't know, anything that's sparse perhaps? Or did I miss something that, that would, for example, not allow this to use, I don't know, implement a sparse map, something like that? So, or like, where exactly is the thing where, like, the requirement that it is a vector um, comes in in this case? So I think if you if you think about something like a map or or you know a hash map, right? <coughs> some of the ideas are very similar. Like, right? an ordered container is essentially building on a very similar structure. Right. Um, I think the the main difference is that the expert, uh, the you know here we basically. Uh, for one, you have this contiguous um, uh, space for like keys for indexes, right? And they're always zero based. And so you can essentially, I think, avoid some of the extra stuff that um, things like H A and T's need to store. So mm -hmm. essentially, for if you think about it um, in this, those cases, right? Uh, you will still most of the time have fairly full nodes uh, because at the end of the day, now, if you merge the leaves, you can end up with one after concatenation with one leaf that is that is not full, but all the other ones you know, the, the, the standard algorithm will, will try to make make them full. Essentially, you know, module concatenation essentially only at the ends you will have something that is not full, right? And so there is no no special mechanism to like try. So there are going to be kind of. Um, more dense, if you will, not as uh, whereas in in, in other containers you can have such you know situation where this guy would be only one element and this this level would be only one element and whatnot. At which point you kind of need to need to keep track of um, which um, you know if you if you have four array of four you want to index into four and you have only one value right is it the first one the second one the third one the fourth one. So what HNTs do is essentially keep like a bit mask, right? And indicate with bits which ones are actually populated and which ones are not. And with things like population count instructions, you can, you can very quickly figure out, oh, you know, I, I keep only two pointers, but they are actually, uh, you know, indexes five and seven or five and eight. Whereas here, we don't do any of that, right? We, we essentially, all the nodes are that kind of you know, full, that they don't have this extra mechanism to support this. I think that's the major difference. But the, the ideas, I, I mean, some of the people behind all of this are, are the same. Uh, like Bill Bagwell, that was, you know, had an influence on both of those things. Um, but if you do a lot of concatenations and deletions, and then you end up with such a fragmented um, tree and behind the vector, I wonder if it's possible to make some kind of a hook into a um, garbage collector so that it kind of defragments it into a whole solid thing. <coughs> I mean, I don't think it's impossible. Uh, <laughs> it's, definitely not, it's definitely not possible currently with Jeeps. Right? There, there is no way for to tell you as a programmer of a library to have GC treat your data structure in a, some special way. right? Um, it might be actually, you know, yeah, it's, it's actually fairly tricky. I'm not even sure if you would like to do it, right? Much of things, you still might have a lot of sharing, right? Those, those subtrees are persistent, so 
if you if essentially if you want to have you know exactly full nice nice contiguous tree, you need to rebuild it, right? So you lose all the sharing uh, by doing that. I'm not sure if you would like to necessarily do that, or if you would like DC to necessarily do this, right? It, you can still do it by just you know reconstructing the whole thing, right? Well, I mean, he's, so one you could implement put it into the um, data structure into the operations themselves. Uh, so you can do, as we probably do, you can do the cleanup while you're doing operations on the tree. So if, if you're touching the tree anyway, you might as well clean it up. And, uh, maybe not in Haskell, but uh, if, if you know you can do it thread safely, then you could do it while you're doing some other operations on the tree. Or would like to mutate and, and try to shift things around yeah. it. Yeah, technically. But as you said, um, you don't want to lose sharing, you don't want to do... Uh, so, I mean, GHC does have like this little hook, right? The space leak yeah, yeah, yeah. fixed. Uh, but this is really hard coded for tuples and record selectors. If you had a mechanism to integrate this into the garbage collector, you might get some benefit because the garbage collector has some synchronization guarantees. For example, it knows there are no threads currently accessing and these kinds of things. So you, if you tried really hard, you could probably put it into the garbage collector. But yeah, I don't um, know if you want to. <laughs> yeah, as I said, I, it's, I don't think it's impossible, but yeah. So let's talk about um, doing things in Haskell. So the first like <coughs> obvious way of, of, of how I kind of started prototyping things is you know you create like a node that contains a, an array uh, that points to other nodes and whatnot. Um, and if you, we go back to, to how things are represented in memory, you know this node guy is going to be essentially a header for the GC and a pointer to an array, right? So, uh, the array, at the very least, will need to have something like a you know, header for the GC and the length information. And then it's going to have pointers to you know, other nodes. So if you compare it to the previous slides, we just added a whole you know, layer of, of pointers in between all our arrays, right? Um, which is kind of sad. Uh, so essentially what I, what I uh, started looking at is GC, if you look closely, exposes a bunch of magical things. Uh, that you know, or, well, that you can use or at your own risk, and uh, which is like those primitive arrays, and, and you can look into them. Some of them are not particularly type safe, and you can actually make one array, you no know, element, uh, uh, array element point to another array directly. Uh, it's called array array hash or something like that. And um, so it's kind of awful, but essentially we could we can get rid of. Those those layers and essentially go back to the, the representation to the to the kind of minimal layout uh, from the previous slides that you know the close to what conception we want to want. Um, so it's it's uh, essentially those GHC ex extensions and <coughs> which are essentially how GHC implements a ton of things that you, you know underneath uh, under the hood. Uh, so if you, you know have the normal your normal array in Haskell. Uh, it's going to be implemented using some of those, some of those, uh, some of those uh, like in, intrinsics, basically some of those primitives, as they're called in in, in Haskell. Um, they're really awful to use and extremely unsafe. Uh, so basically, the the, the most basic uh, indexing allows you to you know read and write arbitrary memory. Um, so you need to be kind of careful <laughs> how to how to do how to use them. But uh, effectively, what we're trying to do is you know, use the stuff uh, to expose a safe interface, and underneath, we try to be just you know a bit more risky and, and make sure that we test it very well. And that's what you know happens also with a bunch of other. Yeah. Go for it. Just uh, one slide back, please. Just another question. Yeah. So, um, uh, sorry, another one. Where, oh. where the this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it seems it seems to me like. A, like an, like an unpacking problem in general, right? Where you say, okay, each of each of these like ends just if each of these ends could immediately then start with like an AL and you just like inline that directly there, then you would achieve the same yeah. goal, right? So yeah. would another solution to that instead of uh, having to drop down to a lower level 
API B to expose some functionality for GHC to like perform this unpacking, or why can it not be done? I mean, again, I don't. I, I I'm always afraid of saying it cannot be done, right? Like they really, really probably can be done. This one is, I think, probably tricky because um, you would essentially, you know, this array can be variable length, right? So if you unpack it, well, how large is a node element, right? It can be the the, the arrays here actually, maybe unfortunately, are the same size, but this could be, you know, one element. This could be two elements, right? All right. So, so you don't have the you don't have the invariant that all your I thought you had this like this B three style thing was always for the same B. So you could perhaps no right, that always the same. We way. got rid of that with with this idea of sound right here. You have only three sequences here, and I have two contrast delays here. Right. So I guess you could um, you could potentially maybe sacrifice some of the memory. Yeah, I mean if you right. don't say okay. And always the allocate the, the, the branching part or the full thing, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, so that would potentially be, be an interesting thing. I, I will get back to your point actually a bit later because I've been doing some crazy experiments with some of this stuff. Um, due to other other reasons. So let's let's chat about it in a few slides. Um, yeah, all right. I'm currently using a uh, this area, area, if you're interesting, uh, interested in, in some of the stuff, I think it's safe to use a small array as well for those purposes uh, at the cost of a few extra unsafe courses. But I'll try to double check that with with GHC folks. Well, the important thing is, so you basically have some data, so you kind of treat it as a byte array, but you know that some bytes actually are pointers and some bytes are actually data. No, no, no. 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 So no, no, no. So that that. Uh, <coughs> So that's not quite true. A garbage collector would be uh, happy with me, I think. If yeah, I'm exactly. Right right. Right. So, so, so what's going to happen um, is, oh come on, I'm going to use byte array for this guy because it's just numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use array array for those guys, and array array is actually a pointer array. It it uh, supports the uh, uh, ability to read other array arrays out of it. Okay. Uh, so it's actually implemented as an array of pointers, mm -hmm. um, and therefore garbage collector will know that oh, this is an array of pointers. I can you know evaluate them and, and scavenge them. Um, and for the side thing, I am using byte array because it's just just integers, right? Um, but you can't pack them into the same data structure. Right. That is true. Right. I, I essentially what I'm doing here is this array array is going to be have at this index point to another array array hash. And at the last index is going to point to the binary hash. And that you're producing. Okay. But here they're all pointers, right? So mm -hmm. so garbage collector is just going to say, oh yeah, it's fine. It's it's a, it's a heterogeneous array, but array arrays are essentially untyped, so it's all good. So it would be nice if GHC provided a data type. I mean, like normal objects in GHC are represented as like a sequence of pointers, yeah. and then a bunch of non-pointer things which the garbage collector ignores. So if GHC provided a data type where you could specify the size of the bytes that follow, then you could put all your pointers in front of it, and or, and GHC, the garbage collector just needs to know how big the object is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's some good idea because as I said, I actually have a slide on some of the problems or okay. some of the things that I run into. So we should we should definitely talk about like <laughs> interesting new things that we could we could do to make some <coughs> things faster. Yeah. yeah. Another question: Did this? So, what did this transformation actually gain you? Because before we had the problem that for each level in the tree, we have two pointers that we have to follow, right? So yeah, this, one. this one and that one uh, yeah. to the next one. But now, if you go back to the side we were just on, we now have this this arrow that you have at the top be an actual pointer, right? So now in order to make your decision, you still have to follow two pointers, maybe once the one to the down and once the one into the, uh, into the, uh, into the array of um, indices. So <coughs> because before you could inline this so into the data type constructor, right? So then you would not have well, to follow Well, again, pointer. again, not really. How do I inline this into the data type constructor? This guy is going to be this, must be the same length as this. Yeah, but those you know that they're equal length, right? Before we had the problem that, um, on different levels, you might have things of different length. But for a given node, you know you will always have as many entries as you have for uh, as you have in the node. So 
Okay, I'm not sure I quite fall. So what are you suggesting that here we would have to expand the, the node with how many elements? Yeah, that, yeah with, well, as many elements as that specific node needs, right? So, so we would have a node, to, a node constructor per, per number of elements. For so example, and you know there are factors of two, right? So if you know the largest one is 32, you, I don't know, have just um, um, six different nodes for that, each one specific. I, I play, played around with some of the stuff, and indexing is slow. Okay. And um, I don't uh, like, it, in principle, you could imagine a compiler optimization that would see that, you know, for indexing, you could, you could notice that the only thing that matters is the offset that you fetch, mm -hmm. right, from your data structure. GHC is not capable of doing that, so essentially it's going to do like, you know, search through all the, all the options try to figure out which index to do, and it's awfully slow. Okay, so basically you're saying here we would have uh, three pointer indirections, and with the optimization we're doing two then, while um, what I suggested yeah. would say, okay, then you can have well, just... Right, I mean, two if, if yeah. your stuff works, then why not just inline the other area as well, right? Right. Um, and then still, essentially, the yeah, indexing yeah. is, is clear. Right, it's, it's yeah, I absolutely yeah, you're right. Um, I actually I literally did benchmarks on this, and for a reason that I'm going to mention in few slides. Okay. Okay. And <laughs> so essentially, this is basically what it's doing. And here is some some kind of you know, comparison to how many um, words of overhead you have in, in storing things with list or um, with the list kind of structure. And essentially, you know, the fact because the array is, is has low overhead we very quickly catch up to this. Um, and that's the kind of bottom line, even at three elements, I think we are, we are kind of uh, catching up. So let's look at graphs. Um, so this is the indexing part, uh, where I'm comparing um, data.vector, data.sequence, and uh, the new structure. Uh, unit is nanoseconds, and essentially, data.vector is boring. It's essentially sitting flatly at 3.2 nanoseconds, so I didn't bother to point the, the, the numbers. But with data sequence, we're actually doing way better, especially at like very high um, collections that are very large. Um, it's pretty neat. Uh, so effectively for indexing, we're actually fairly close to what data vector achieves. This is all with the warm cache, right? So this is, this is quite new, all warm cache, yes. Yeah. Um, I, that is actually one of the interesting questions. So, how do you how would you test some uh, cold cache scenario? Uh, you run something that flushes your cache uh, on the side. I, I mean, as part of a benchmark. Right. I mean, <clears throat> that's the only other thing that I came up with, except for this one, is allocate a whole lot of those 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 vectors and then index from 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 the start again. Ah, oh, okay. Um, but uh, those are the only thing, two things that, that come to my mind, and I don't think Criterion really supports the flushing the, the cache automatically, so we would need to essentially flush it with like writes as part of your benchmark, which means then you need to subtract the time to flush it from your... And at that point I was like, yeah, okay, I want to do it later. <laughs> yeah, you need to run it without operation and then just... Right, and then you know, you manually mm. subtract. And, mm, it's, it's a bit. Um, it would be nice if uh, it's criterion supported a delta of that kind, yeah. Yeah, I, I get that. That would probably be optimal, right? Because then it would actually be able to do some of this calculation on our stop timer or something. Mm. Uh, so this is all one cache. Um, I don't think it would. I mean, it would probably increase the distance between. Um, between data dot vector and, and the data tree, I would expect we would probably look a bit worse compared to data dot vector. Um, but it would probably also even affect even more the data dot sequence because it's more pointer heavy and has a small overhead in terms of um, memory. So, yeah. But the distance to vector might grow, right? Yes, that's the, 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 I would expect, right? Because we are. Well, we have a bit more overhead compared to essentially zero overhead or or vector or data vector. Um, so, um, how about constructing um, a 
either data in a sequence or, or this tree. So essentially this is from list. You get a list of you know, two elements, ten elements, five elements, and so on. And we measure the time it takes to construct it. And essentially we go from here the sequence being faster, so we're taking six nanoseconds for two elements, eight nanoseconds for, for our stuff, 1832 again, the data vector being faster. Um, and then we are kind of starting to catch up at around you know over a hundred elements and before one thousand where the RRB stuff is actually becoming um, faster. So here we are also talking about three uh, microseconds against three point nine microseconds. And at the kind of million, one million elements, we were at 15 milliseconds against almost 30 milliseconds for, for the sequence. So essentially, I think it's it's suffering a bit more because it's running out of probably L2 quick, more quickly, and that's probably what's the same. But the point I think is that even at small sizes, we are, we are fairly good, um, even even though, uh, you know, can, yeah. How are you adding? Actually, are you adding one by one, or are you adding? No, this is from list. So this is bulk, bulk oh. operation of of. Um, you know, here is your list. Give me the whole thing uh, from that list. Okay. Which means that well, I'm not sure what what the sequence is doing internally. I actually don't know. Mm. But I think it's all uh, uh, essentially standard Haskell data type. So I don't think there's any interpolities there. What I'm doing is is I have multiple arrays. So I'm essentially you know building it from kind of bottom up manner as such that it's you know it doesn't need this extra s information about sizes mm. and tries to avoid copies as much as possible so i think the only thing that we the only copy that um i do that is might be unnecessary is the last leaf because i don't know the length and i need to freeze it mm. and and that's like in the last extra copy that that might happen it kind of it kind of sucks for the small one, but if you have only one leaf, then then uh, I do have special case for for those some special cases for those ones, and um, and data the sequence also has special cases for 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 for, for the small shorter uh, uh, lists. It's just that um, I think the standard Haskell data types are kind of faster than arrays, and I'll get back to that. So that's actually you know those two slides are the good news. Um, and you know, uh, uh, show that we're doing fairly good. This is the bad news. So this is uh, going back to your element. This is one by one append to the end. So you start with an empty, empty sequence, and then you append one element, and then you append the second element, right? As like two operations. And um, and here the other sequence is far better. Uh, so essentially we're going through from again 16 to and 15 nanoseconds, so already like more than 3x, uh, 80 uh, nanoseconds for the sequence, 253 for, for our tree, and it's not getting better uh, further down. Uh, so the distance is fairly, fairly large. Um, so my, some of the, essentially what I was, what I'm currently experimenting with is, is trying to bridge this a bit. Um, with uh, kind of introducing a, some buffering instead of updating the tree all the time. Essentially, if you think about you know those cases where you we, where you append things over and over, essentially if you have a larger tree, for every element that you append, you need to copy the whole branch all you know to the, to the go go to the very bottom, update all the all the arrays uh, along the branch, and then do the same thing again for the next element. And then the same thing uh, you know, again for, for the next element. And that's essentially what, what you know is why why we're suffering. So and, and this goes back to this um, third reference that I uh, mentioned, the chunk sequence paper that I said that I initially you know what was trying to use more and then I actually do. And what they are were essentially discussing is the idea of having two buffers at the front, two buffers at the end. Um, where you essentially kind of try to amortize some of those those uh, additions, and you know you you if you append, you only change this this buffer, and then you know you can you can also support nicely popping things uh, from it. And I actually uh, initially wanted to implement the data structure like this, and always having those buffers, and always uh, hopefully be having faster append and prepend. 
And <clears throat> the sad thing is that the indexing option suffers surprisingly much, like much more than I expected. And the problem is essentially very simple. Like if you have fifth element, where is it? Right? Like you need to figure out which of those guys have it. The first buffer, the second buffer, the three, the, the fourth or fifth buffer. And all those extra branches are actually hurt enough that I abandoned the idea. Um, but it kind of comes back now. How about if you could um, <clears throat> expose two things? One, an API that you know where you can push multiple elements at the same time, such that you, you can amortize yourself this cost of you know updating the, the branch and, and appending things one by one. But if we have this batch API, we could also add a wrapper, like you know, essentially say construct this guy only if you ask for it. Uh, it makes it easier to, to you know, construct the, the, the whole vector. And once you're done appending or whatnot, you can, you can you know, convert back to the fuel tree, which is actually, in a way, tries to go in the direction of, you know, if you don't need this, then you don't pay for this. So indexing remains fast. If you only construct and, and then use it, again, you don't you know, pay the extra extra wrapper. But if you need it, um, and especially if you need to mix uh, indexing and appending, like you know, append one element, index into vector, append one element, index into vector, then such a wrapper I think might provide um, you know a, an easy interface. But if you have better ideas, I'm actually all yours. <laughs> I would be very interested to, to, to hear them. Um, so that's currently my, um, uh, one of the questions that I still kind of trying to grasp. Also, um, if, you, if you have an API to batch, like you know, append five elements uh, at once, right? What kind of API would you expect to, to use? Um, would it be a list, like from list, you know, where you say, push back many elements and then provide a list, would it be something else? If you have opinions, shout. Yeah, in the opinion. Could be ST based or something. Hmm? Vector or something. So you're doing something mutable and then you freeze it kind of thing. Yeah, I would do something similar but make it like a monolith. So you can convert all these things you want to append into monoids uh, and append them together. Uh, and then also convert your your whole uh, vector kind of thing into a monoid, also pen it together, and then have some function to sort of like turn this big monoid into the sequence again. Like a builder. Like a builder monoid, or like a string builder. Or right, so essentially, <coughs> you could imagine just, just adding one of, essentially going in more of a direction of this buffer, right? Where yeah. you, you append something to some, uh, uh, one of those, whatever they, those buff things are, and then go back, yeah. I mean, you can, uh, this only really, the performance <coughs> advantage only really comes if you append, or could you also kind of have a batch insert into the middle? What, where could you benefit, actually? So, I, I currently, I don't plan on supporting insert into the middle. Um, it sounds, or personally, I don't find it as a, massively important and yeah. it makes essentially I don't think you can you can now be logarithmic anymore. Like if you have a full thing in the middle and you want to in insert something. Well actually you, maybe you could add extra branches but it's it's uh, I don't know. Sounds yeah, it, that's what I was saying. So uh, I mean the most likely use case is to batch append, right? Right. Um, maybe there's a use case to batch prepend, I don't know. Uh, but I think that the one that I would go with in the first version, if you want to support this, um, would be batch append. And then you could just, yeah, normal build a pattern. Why did you have two, uh, two buffers on each side again? I cannot. Um, <coughs> so the different thing is, is if you all want to amortize in the presence of popping and pushing. Yeah. Uh, so the idea would be that, and then the inner buffers would be either empty or full, never in between. And he would essentially push uh, to this guy, then substitute, um, and then you know we'd essentially get rid of the, the this situation where pushing one element and then popping and pushing and popping and pushing and popping requires you to go to this guy 
uh, every single time. Okay. Uh, so this is the list chunk sequence. It's in our so what they are doing is they actually want to amortize a one and uh, prevent you know popping and pushing. Um, so they do put extra restrictions of you know this guy would also need to, to have this functionality, this kind of property, right? Because in our case this would not be a, a one anymore because the buffers are fixed and they're free growth, right? So you can't amortize this point. But in, in reality it's just still gives you quite a nice benefit. Um, but you could potentially only have one as well. I actually haven't decided yet. And I just wanted to mention the, the, the chunk sequence thing because it's actually a fairly neat, neat idea. And I think that's also what um, the Rust package that I mentioned at the beginning, that's, that's what uh, they're doing as well. Oh, their setting is slightly different, right? Because they, they have a different attitude towards uh, immutability and or potential to, for, for using immutability in, in thanks to Rust's time system. Right, so um, essentially having just a buff, single buffer uh, for those experiments and using, you know, essentially, you know, batching together a bunch of a bunch of pushes, we can get this green line, and um, where for very small ones we are actually fairly competitive. Um, it's still slower. Um, I'm not sure if we, if it, I would be able to actually bring it through all that. I mean, to some degree, I think data that sequence does offer a one, a one. Um, Pending, prepending, and popping. Uh, so it is it is uh, slightly more kind of focused on the on this use case. Um, but at least we we don't you know suck so much anymore. Um, so it's it's you know it's usually below two x right. Um, one point three microseconds, two point one microseconds, fifteen micros against twenty six. So it starts to be actually decent. Um, I also implemented take and drop, and actually they are fairly competitive, just didn't uh, have time to benchmark them. Um, so, <clears throat> this is one of those things that I actually wanted to <laughs> chat about, about some better interfaces in JC. Turns out, um, arrays are kind of slow in, in JC, uh, especially compared to like ordinary Haskell APs. Um, and I did like little experiments with having uh, you know a large sum type that <coughs> supported storing one element, two elements, three elements, and so on. And, you know, having a constructor for each of those cases, and then benchmarking things like you know how expensive is it to push extra element at the back, right? And it's usually much faster than, than arrays. Um, I haven't uh, went to the level of actually measuring things with like performance counters and, and perf tools. Uh, but I think the my main hypothesis currently is that um, we write to the memory twice. Uh, so essentially what the way uh, arrays work in NGHC is that first you need to call this kind of one of those you know, intrinsics that GHC provides saying new byte array or so, right? Or new array array. And, and that intrinsic will already do, um, so actually not for byte array it won't, but for any pointer based array, it will initialize it already by itself. And I think the main reason for that is that if um, that array would be you know, uh, encountered by a garbage collector, then it must contain something that you know, the, the GC can deal with. If it's just complete garbage and GC interprets that as uh, pointers, bad things can happen. Um, but the sad thing is that, for my use case, it's going to get allocated, the GC intrinsic will initialize it, and then I'm going to override all the elements anyway because I want, you know, whatever I want there, right? Uh, whether it's, it's copying the elements of the old array or whatever else. Um, so essentially what's going to happen is, is that we're going to write the same memory twice. We're going to have two loops that go over all those elements. Um, I actually don't have a, like, a nice idea of how, um, what kind of interface would be required to make this uh, nice and safe. The only thing that comes to my mind right now is if GHC at that level was able to inline that intrinsic into, into your code, and then figure out that you know the same the whole array is initialized and then fully overwritten and then just aligned the, the initialization from the intrinsic. 
That being said, it's not capable of doing that today, and I don't think it really has the infrastructure to, to do this kind of analysis. Um, so something to, I don't know, chat maybe with Rehan with that one. <coughs> uh, well, primitive arrays are pain to work with. Um, essentially, you know, as I said, they by default they're just reads from memory. So if you get your index wrong, uh, it's you're reading random garbage from somewhere in the heap. If you're writing it, you know, at random addresses, it's, it's kind of worse. Um, so what I essentially do is is every single operation that, that does anything with an array, like with, with a primitive array, I have a wrapper that has uh, bounds checking. And then I have some expressivity to disable it for, for performance reasons when I'm not debugging. Um, it would be kind of nice if, if GC could generate this for me. Um, I wouldn't mind it at all. And in the meantime, I might just like write a library that exposes all those internal links with just extra bounds checking uh, that you can disable if you pass the right option. I mean, why just not add those functions to the list of functions available? Even not like having a, like a flag that turns it the one way or the other, but just have one that has a checked read and one that doesn't, and have it always available. So the current intrinsics in GHC are actually, they are implemented in like actual insights of GHC, they, they, they just recognize them. Um, so I'm not sure if they would be terribly excited about, <coughs> about adding something that can be expressed as a library. But because this stuff you could, you could, you know, you could, can do the array checks as a library. No, I mean, I would imagine that like the, the, the functions they're using is, I don't know, like, unsafe index byte array hash or something like this? Could there not be like unsafe index byte array with crash if blah 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 hash? So that it would like crash. Would, would, would you want to hard call that into JC if you can have a library that does that? that, that, that? Mm. But I, I don't know, depends on where you want to use it, I guess. Like, I mean, I just find it would make sense if I f could find the um, index safe version right next to where the non-index safe version is. Well, you could basically, so the, the primitives are usually implemented in C++, minus minus, right? Or as, uh, or inline a generator called, by the yeah. compiler when it translates to assembly? Yeah, or I think we're the most of, a, a lot of the array ones, so are at the kind of SDG to CMM level yeah. conversion, um, except for the allocated ones. Those are actually in, in like separate CMM file mm. in, in the RDS, uh, if you can call it. Yeah, so you could prob yeah, if, if there was an advantage to have the bounce check seen by the compiler, for example, Clang can do some bounce, which might be helpful to add it to the compiler directly. Otherwise, you do like the array library, you do it in Haskell. Yeah, I mean, CMM is more of an AR, right? So <coughs> like, even if it was something like Clang, I, I don't think you, um, the LLVMIR, I don't think yeah. it actually expresses those kind of things, right? The client might emit extra extra checks around the, the unsafe ones, presumably, is that? No, the safe? important one is that you can eliminate the unnecessary checks. Right, but then they, they need to be separate, right? Like, right, then um, you actually do want to have the, the unsafe version and the error, you know, bounce checks separately as separate uh, concepts in your IR, such that you can move the error check and then align it. Yeah, so the basically, the, you could say I'm just writing if statements in Haskell, they translate to some if right. uh, 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 branching in, in the CMM, or in the IR, um, and then you hope that the compiler is smart enough to make the association that this is actually a check on the length and therefore, and so on. Uh, the other thing is if you think this is too fragile, then you could have, a spe then you could teach the compiler about uh, bounds, Met metadata, and then you, then it might be useful to have right. the bound information generated I as part of the primitive. That's what you're saying. But so essentially, it would, <coughs> it would essentially teach GHC to, to understand that this is not a random comparison yeah. with bounce checks. It's more like this is specifically for, for this array, and maybe it's going to make it easier to, to optimize it away. Yeah. I see, I see. No, that's not, that's not a bad idea. You want to say something? Oh, no, just 
Um, so uh, another thing that um, I ran into that was quite interesting is that um, I was actually thinking of using like a wrappers around those primitive arrays whenever I'm doing something with uh, with them uh, because it's just more convenient than unlisted types uh, due to a bunch of reasons. Uh, like I don't think you can have new types around unlisted stuff like primitives uh, and whatnot. Uh, so <coughs> I tried to use that and, and, and have a look at that and kind of you know, hoping that worker wrapper optimizations would kind of save my day and doesn't really do this. Um, so essentially what I'm currently doing is just passing those unlifted arrays around uh, myself. There, you can do some interesting things that I just discovered with things like uh, pattern synonyms um, where you can say Oh, I'm going to make this um, appear as a Haskell data type, but in fact, it's going to be just an unboxed Haskell. Um, so there are some some interesting things that I think I'll need to rework. There's actually a very interesting ticket uh, that is, I think, uh, open has been open for like 11 years at this point. Um, You're saying very low number, yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it's a suspicion. I think we're ten thousand something now, right? Yeah, I think we are uh, over 10k. <laughs> And so this is suspiciously short, right? Like the first sign sounds, sounds interesting. Um, especially, so worker wrapper essentially, the, uh, what it does for maybe for background is Haskell has, say, has an int type, right? And an int type is, is really a heap object, uh, just like you've seen, like with a header and with an actual machine integer. Uh, so two words. Um, so if you would have a loop, a you know, recursive function that adds something, it would be super slow because you would need to you know, allocate a new object for every iteration. Uh, so what GHC does is, is splits up uh, this kind of type loop that operates on machine integers called the worker. And then there's the wrapper that does initially the reference the, the integer, takes the, you know, extracts the machine integer and calls the, the worker. It's, it's a really neat stuff, except that it uh, doesn't really work for nested things. Um, so especially if you return uh, something like an unboxed tuple that has an ordinary int, and you would really like to have an you know, GC turn that into an unboxed tuple that has an int hash, the machine teacher. It doesn't work. Um, so. I mean, one other thing that I um, is very subjective, um, but I found extremely valuable when uh, playing around with this stuff is having an ability to visualize, visualize the stru tree structure. Uh, it actually helped me catch a bunch of problems in in terms of how it's structured, when things some certain things are happening that are somewhat unexpected. Um, you know, and whatever you however you visualize it, if it's you know a doc file or, or an image or just ASCII, uh, it's still extremely convenient to be able to do that. So if, if you ever try to implement trees and stuff like that, I recommend ability to to kind of print the structure somehow. And for the testing, again, one of the final things is that uh, I literally had bugs that would not be detected if I didn't have one of those. Um, whichever one you pick and remove, that would allow bugs to, to actually creep in. Um, so probably based testing is great, but you know you really want to have strong assertions and you really want to also be able to come up with some specific really ugly examples yourself. Um, and yeah, I found all of them really, all three are really important. Ah, so what's next? Um, yeah, as I said, it's actually, yeah. So for probability-based testing, do you just pick like this operation, then generate a bunch of inputs and do this, or do you generate operation sequences? I currently mostly uh, the, the former. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually, so I always started doing some of the latter, so essentially the current way of creating a, a, the structure can be constructed in different ways. Uh, so I essentially, the current way is, is slightly primitive. I'm, I'm thinking of just generating like a, 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 some kind of a tree that describes what, what happens to the vector. The current one is essentially generate me three lists. Uh, uh, one of them I'm going to use to call from lists, the other one to prepend, the other one to append. 
um, and then use that resulting structure for or the battery or for any test that I'm after. Because, I mean, this is a prime example where you can do um, model-based testing, right? So you have a simple or a, a known correct implementation that you can reference against, and then you can generate a sequence of operations with some pre and post conditions, uh, and then test that the, se that the results are always the same. Yeah, so I'm, I'm can't, uh, so as I said, I'm not quite doing exactly that mm -hmm. yet, um, because I don't generate this sequence of operations really, I still have separate things. <coughs> But I am using essentially data load sequence as this kind of oracle thing that I compare against. So I'm essentially, um, <coughs> you know, generating the both both of those sequences and doing particular um, stuff, particular operations on them and comparing them where they both agree. But yes, I'm I'm thinking of, of actually generating like a proper sequence of operations that would be you know completely random and then seeing what comes out the other end. It's just that the generation, I think it's my, the, the best option to, to go and the, the most powerful one, it's just that the generation is slightly more complex yeah. uh, because you know you don't necessarily want to do you know, silly operations like I think from an MP thing. Yeah, that's why That's why you have the, you have the set of operations. There's some presentations I can. Right. Uh, basically you have some preconditions. So mm -hmm. you, because you have the model, you know what the current state is and therefore you yeah. know which operations are admissible. Yeah. I also recently did something like this, like similar to what you're saying, where instead of just generating the actions and running them on your implementation and running on the model, you sort of uh, generate the actions and um, this, the model at the same time. Um, so you sort of start with like an empty sequence, uh, you check what can I do with this in like a quick check generator or something. So for example, you can add something. Uh, so then you return this one action and the updated sequence. And then based on that sequence, you generate the oh, next section. So then at the end, you have like a list of things to do and sort of the expected result. Or you can also check it at every step or check some like the, for example, the invariance of your data type at every step uh, and test it that way. Oh, that sounds actually really cool. Yeah, especially evolving, <coughs> figuring out, I think, I, I, figuring out exactly which operations are valid currently based on the, the kind of, you know, non-good implementation, that could be pretty powerful. Yeah. yeah I, should, I should try that, but I didn't think of it. Cool. So, as I said, um, finished some of the stuff, like, I actually um, uh, didn't implement concatenation yet. Um, so really it would be kind of nice to actually take advantage of the, the, the relaxed part of the RP tree. Um, and you know, because I do so much time on experimenting things, there's a lot of stuff that should not really be there. Um, but hopefully within the next few, few months, there's going to be time on, on GitHub. Um, and then there are some, some extra ideas of, well, if you think about storing something like a vector of integers, right, of it, um, in the leaves, you will still have each leaf is going to be really a array of pointers to those heap allocated integers, which is kind of awful if you think about it. Um, so being able to actually at the leaves uh, say, oh, let's allocate a byte array that is going to keep just the integers themselves uh, could be really neat. And um, that being said, I mean, it, it, it would be more of a complementary thing, like if you want, would like to store lazy integers, right? Like lazy values that might result, you know, be due to some computations. You actually don't want this, right? Because it's, you know, essentially taking away the, the laziness of those integers. Uh, but it would be nice to have the ability, right? It, you know, quite often you know that you don't necessarily need the laziness in, in those values, and that would, you know, get rid of essentially all, you know, half, all those pointers. That would be nice. Another interesting thing is, uh, well, it's kind of uh, weird, I guess, to edit that the uh, you know, last slide of talk about immutable vectors and talk about immutable API. Um, however, this, so uh, if you look at the Scala implementation of, the, of those trees, they are using a very interesting idea. They don't keep um, the standard representation of a tree, like, you know, this is a root and I just drop those things. What they do is, um, they keep pointers to a branch. To you know, they keep a pointer to the leaf. They keep a pointer to its parent. They keep a pointer to its parent, and so on. So essentially, they have this what they call a focused branch of the tree. And, and what they um, use it for is that if you uh, focus, say, the very first leaf, 
and you try to then iterate over the tree, then you don't need to traverse uh, the tree over and over again. If you just linearly traverse it, you're essentially just going to be kind of hopping through, through those leaves and, and those branches. And same with updating. If you're making multiple updates and to the same leaf, if it's this, this focused one, you don't need the, the traversal and you can postpone updates through to the, to the parents. Um, so that's actually quite an interesting concept for, for a mutable API. So one of the problems that I've um, seen with, with things like tree structures in Haskell, right, especially in this one, you could imagine that I could create a mutable tree. But the problem is that um, if you want to go between mutable and immutable versions, you would essentially need to uh, do a copy of the whole tree. Um, because, and even if you were to do something like an in-place freeze, you still need to go to every single array and call this, you know, fancy freeze of, of every single array, right? Which is awful, like this is, this is not really what you, what you want. If you were to only look at, you know, have keep track of this branch, you could keep all the other leaves, all, all the other arrays immutable, and only keep this one branch that is, you know, mutable, but, uh, mutable arrays. And as such that this localized update, these localized mutations could be quick. Uh, and then if you switch to a different branch, then you would freeze that one and, and um, throw the other one. So it's, it's, uh, it's Scala, so this is not thread safe, of course, right? So uh, you just need to make sure that you're so the only one who can access the mutable stuff, right? So Scala, I, I think, still is doing a copy and write for, for mutations. Um, However, you still can um, essentially, um, <clears throat> if you focus on the leaf, I mean, a, a bunch of updates go to the leaf, you can postpone the updates of the whole, of the whole branch, of the rest of the branch. Mm. Until you need to freeze it again. Uh, so I mean, freezes is a Haskell concept, they, they, don't, uh, they don't really need No, but it, if you want to turn it into an immutable tree again, you need to copy the currently mutable path and then start a new one if you do further mutations. Yeah, of course, right. But I, I think my, my point is that this idea of focus branch allows you to have some mutation, but only a, but the freeze operation is still going to be logarithmic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because you need to only freeze or, or thaw the, the particular branch that you're after. Um, at the cost that, you know, yes, mutations or, and, and you know, one mutation at the end, one mutation to be to the, at the front will not benefit, right? It's only kind of buying you things if you have locality, if you actually um, are able to look. So that's just more of an idea, then, then I'm not sure if I'm going to actually do it, and um, we'll see. Does that actually help with the, um, the batch append use case? I mean, it sounds like Bite. it could. It would. Okay. But if you want to do an unsafe technique in, in, in place, so it, can't you just unsafe it here the whole time? Well, but uh, how does that work? Right? You, have, you have 50 arrays, and JC needs to update a header of each one of them. Well, oh, you need, you, it, and safe freeze, what it does is essentially it changes this header for JC, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it overrides it with some special value. So if you have 50 arrays, your unsafe trees in place would need to mutate 50 arrays. So you need to still traverse all the tree, the whole tree, to update each one and every one of them separately. Mm -hmm. Right? And I mean, that's, that's one of those funny parts. Like, if you actually wanted to have like a, a you know, mutable analog containers, right? Then this is still a problem of how do you do this? It's even, it even comes up if you have an array of arrays, right? A data dot vector that stores other data dot vectors. Uh, right? If you want to have mutations everywhere, freezing is still a pain. What would be an outcome if you forget to change the header of each of array and just unsafe repairs the whole thing one at the um, level and then do some operations in it, assuming it's a uh, <coughs> immutable array? So <coughs> I don't think it gives you any particular guarantees. I think it would still work. Um, it's just that GHC would um, consider, the GC would consider it probably mutable. But I don't but think it would. I, I just don't know what, 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 what is the difference in behavior then between for garbage collection between the uh, 
frozen dash and then not invisible. So mutable so array is actually bigger because it um, it needs to keep track of mutations for for a bunch of reasons. Uh, so it actually allocates something called a card table, which basically has one byte per array element, one byte of it. I think I it's five. It's, it's byte per more than one. Element. I'm pretty sure it's, it's uh, we have quite a few elements actually. There's this some some. Ah, I, I was looking that uh, I think it's more than hundred elements per per bind or something. I uh, that could be yeah because basically if you have it in the old generation in, in the garbage collector right. and then you modify it then the PC needs to rescan it for possible pointers into the young generation. Mm -hmm. So uh, and in order to avoid having to rescan the whole uh, array. Uh, it uses a card table, which is what the Java GC uh, garbage collectors also do, but in this case only for the array. So it basically says one byte per, yeah, you're right, one byte per section of, I don't know, 128. But then if you have a box session for int from the world, you don't need that. Yeah, so in this case, but it still would allocate it, right? So, uh, I mean. So, depends, right? Like small array. And so this small array is a small array hash is something that Johan uh, um, added to JC because of unordered containers, mm -hmm. because he didn't want the card table, so he doesn't have it. Okay. Um, and with the idea of well, the card table if you if you have you know essentially, you know it's kind of really really useful if you have very large arrays. And I hear the idea. I think the idea is that if you have small array that is mutable for a very short period of time and then immediately frozen. Um, then you don't really benefit a whole lot out, out of it. Uh, so that was his motivation to just you know cut down on the memory overhead. So you could do those kind of things. Um, I'm actually not sure uh, what exactly the difference would be for those small arrays if you see saw the mutable versus the mutable one. Um, I mean, I know that for what for mutable you definitely cannot duplicate things, right? Uh, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it would necessarily break any correctness stuff. I'm not uh, actually no, I'm not an, an entirely sure. I mean, I guess okay. So here's the thing: like, if you think about it, the GC still will need to know of any of those. Oops. Yeah, actually, there's no, nothing more. Uh, the GC will still need to need to know that the particular. Um, array might have pointers to, to the young generation. Every time it's coming to the young generation, it needs to know that. So then the question becomes, uh, would it actually necessarily scan those arrays later? I think actually uh, avoiding duplication is actually quite a tricky one because you need to kind of, I don't know, that was the thanks. Uh, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> e yeah, I, mean, I, I would be surprised if JC actually Duplicated in array, even in, in, even if it's immutable, I would be surprised. Small ones, I think it might. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, it tries to avoid it, but it, you might have race condition in the if you, if you do concurrent stuff where it accidentally duplicates it, but then we just live with it. But for mutable structures, you should avoid that. So, for example, for thunks, it tries not to duplicate them right. um, because it could potentially create exponential amount of work duplication, but uh, that's the best effort thing, um, as far as I know. I don't know what if you need something from mutable arrays for this. Yeah, so I, I think the answer is it probably would work, uh, <laughs> but I'm not entirely sure and you know what are exactly the consequences of that. Um, yeah, it's maybe we should we should. Ask someone in like uh, one of the signings, and <laughs> um, it probably would still work, right? Like if you see the, the garbage collector just needs to you know see the the right header, it would which is probably fine. But I don't know. Might, there might be some some interesting performance performance problem here, right? Uh, I don't know. You always have to be careful with this stuff. There's a lot of assumptions in the garbage collector, and if you silently, I mean, generally. Uh, Mutable has more invariants than immutable ones, so I guess it could be well, safe on this side if you make it mutable instead of immutable. But definitely the other way around would definitely be risky. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, so far I'm just essentially 
<clears throat> for most of the operations using the usual pattern of allocate to do some mutation uh, in place trees, the landscape trees, and, that's, and then just use the immutable ones. Um, I'm not sure what it would be exactly the consequences. Yeah. Something maybe to, to ask at CA Fox, some, someone might know. Actually, yeah, you should announce the story hack. Yeah, uh, we'll do that right after. So I think that's basically it. And um, we have any more questions? So I think another data point that we haven't looked at this already is like closures persistent vectors. Yeah. Because I think they use something very similar and they might also have a bag of tricks. I think they're actually using the same thing. Yeah. I'm just, uh, I just haven't really looked at it. And the fact that I don't know closure doesn't yeah. particularly help. <laughs> uh, but yes. So I don't actually have a project that right now needs it. I had in mind some projects that would benefit from having something like this. And so a bunch of times before I used something like a list simply because it was the easiest thing around. Um, and I wished for something that has you know less memory overhead. Um, I don't think it was necessarily, yeah, who knows? I, I've had a few cases where I just thought that, oh, it would be nice to have something like, you know, C++ vector or something like that um, is convenient to use in Haskell uh, with respect to, say, being able to append things to it and giving me quick, quick, quick indexing. So data that vector that didn't quite cut it and data that sequence is actually fairly heavy on pointers as well. So I don't have like an example of, of um, where I'm going to use it next, exactly. Uh, but essentially, any, any <clears throat> in any context that um, I want to store a collection of, of you know, values that I actually want to fully store in memory, like that's not just a lazy list, I'll probably use it instead of list. Um, Did you think about making this kind of the lazy version of that? So that you actually have some behavior of lazy lists and in, in, uh, in that respect? Like lazy allocating with branches? Um, not really, I think. And so also having this, um, what you discussed with the buffer to append things like I mean, append to things, just, just put it into each branch of lazy to create branches. And so there are essentially a bunch of questions actually here. Uh, so I didn't want to compete with the normal list, like for you know, you essentially the list can be used to, for things like just iterating over a collection, right? Like you know, a bunch of other languages have iterators. This is kind of the, the calls we get in the immutable world, right? Um, so that I didn't want to compete, and I think data that this is kind of close to uh, good or as good as you can get, essentially you could potentially have multiple elements per, per, per um, node, but that's about it, right, for that fully lazy version. Um, now for uh, having laziness inside the structure, right, like as you build it up, um, one of the tricky parts in, in this part, or one of the things that you would actually need to do is go back to this representation where you actually have this good data, it has the data types. Like, because I'm using the primitive arrays, there can be no laziness. Uh, essentially, you would need to have the, the uh, values in those arrays would need to go, essentially, you would need to go back to this, this part, right? Because the, uh, the primitive arrays cannot be lazy, there, there can be no laziness. Can uh, I do that for that? Like unbox the tuples, like, or an unbox tuples, and then have Special constructor for you saying like that the uh, lazy can kind of find that that. Um, but you would need to have some kind of interaction, right? Like essentially, you can't go from from this area to this area. You would need to have some interaction to say, oh, this might be actually some kind of a suspended computation, right? 
Mm -hmm. uh, so you would need to have this extra layer of pointers uh, at every level to support you know the, the use case of oh this might actually be lazy. Uh, by getting a little bit of those those intermediate stuff, you essentially make everything straight. Um, if, if if you would have like unbox the uh, sum, and inside would be an unbox array with a little layer of what we would call the, the uh, with small array for, for a node and small array for um, this additional information we have to simulate the data. And I don't in, in this unbox the sum would be uh, like turn the way it should then kind of minimize the number of interactions we have to do. It would be just as one more. We would store, essentially, we need to store an extra bit of information which thing it is, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think you would you can store unboxed sums in arrays in Haskell today. There is no such array that you could use. So oh, you if you use if store uh, uh, yes. Right? You, the, essentially either an array is, is either pointers or non pointers. There can be the, currently in GT there is no nothing in between. I mean you do have this at least a bit of information which one it is, right? So you would, at least today, you would need to have some kind of interaction. I don't think you can avoid that. Yeah, so technically have a different yeah. case. Like that's, well, that's, another, that's another thing, but essentially you still need to have this bit of information somewhere, right? That it's either pointer to, to that or this, and this, where is this bit of information stored? It can't be in the area because it's not a pointer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's thank yeah. Michal. Thank you.